Thank you, choir. We appreciate that very much. I love that song. And the vital reminder that the Lord Jesus Christ is poised and ready to return. He could return this very day. It's good for God's people to keep that in mind. We trust that you have a personal relationship with the one and only coming Savior. And then beyond that, that you are with his help, loving and serving him so that you and I will not be ashamed before him at his coming. What a great day. We've come to worship our great God and our Savior. Uh, it's the summer months. Uh, just about every week we have a goodly number of our people that are away from us temporarily. But invariably on those weekends like today, we have many special guests and visitors that come in. And uh, so make sure that you look around today. God has especially graced us today with a goodly number of special guests and visitors, and we are so glad that they and each one of you are here. Uh, let's pray our Word of Life mission team home. They are scheduled to arrive sometime tomorrow, so keep that in mind. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 2. We're reading one more time, verses 7 through 14. Genesis chapter 2, beginning with the 7th verse and reading through the 14th. As you find it, I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and the Onyx Stone. And the name of the second river is Gion. The same is it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hittical. That is it which goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Thank you. you may be seated for a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we've entered into these gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. And, oh, Lord, how we love uh, our faithful people in this place, both members and friends, but also how we love it when you, in your sovereignty and your spirit orchestration, brings many special guests and visitors our way. What a wonderful privilege it is to worship the author and finisher of our faith and to do so together like this. I pray, Lord, that you'd be exalted and honored and glorified at every turn, including even our time of giving. God, you continue to shower your blessings on us, not only individually, but corporately as a church, and we offer to you our praise. And Lord, I pray for our Word of Life mission team as they uh, soon head back home. I pray that you would uh, bless them and that you would see them on home safely. And Lord, we certainly are looking forward to hearing their testimony and report. Thank you for what you have done and are doing and will do. Lord, I pray that uh, you would be working in every heart and life, starting with mine. I pray that each one of us would be greatly impacted, yea, changed as we have sung, changed by the inscripturated truth of God's word, changed by the gospel. Oh God, how we pray for those who have not yet put personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior. I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. Stir our hearts, change us. Oh God, we pray for Jesus' sake and in his matchless name. Amen.
Thank you, brother. That was uh, Jesus, Jesus, how I love him, how I trust him, and, and we're, we're drawn to him much through music as well. And thank you. Let's stand together and turn over to 336. I believe I have the right number, isn't it? Yeah, it is 336. <laughs> 336 and singing verse 1, 3, and 4. Children are dismissed out when we sing that verse 3 or the second verse there. <clears throat> oh, worship the King. 336, 1, 3, and 4. <clears throat> Oh, worship the King.
We have a shepherd who guides and leads. He invariably goes before. Of course, we know by way of experience that he also comes behind and he also is beside. He covers all of the bases. He does indeed lead us by his hand via faith now, via the inscripturated word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. But I, I think most of the time he just plain carries us. Kind of like a little lamb. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Our music exalts you, and that's the way it ought to be. And our ladies have just reminded us of a wonderful and blessed truth, and, and in fact a most blessed analogy. You know how you desire to lead us, Lord, in every way, and as we've noted, one of the ways, one of the very clear and primary ways in which you lead us is through the inscripturated word of God, and so we are about to do the right thing. We're in the right place about to do the right thing. We're opening up the pages of the book. We care not for the teachings of men. We settle for nothing short of the inspired, inerrant, infallible, trustworthy word of God to man. And e even the human authors that you used to pen the words were born along by the Holy Spirit of God. Tremendous miracle. And if Adam himself is guiding us on this tour, and we believe strongly that he is, and if he is speaking and writing and has that capacity, and we know that he did, and much more, then we can be assured that what we read and even what we see is God-breathed. So again, may we be impacted by your truth. Today we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Our study in Genesis continues. Adam, in chapter 2, verses 7 through 14, is giving us a tour of the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God. You and I, for those of you that have been here, we have been impressed with all of the topographical and geographical and even geological details that are given in the narrative each one of those details testifying loudly and clearly of the realness of the place. And God certainly will continue to emphasize that as we proceed. We noted last week that Eden was actually a region. Look again how Adam states it in verse 8 of chapter 2, Genesis 2 and verse 8a. 
and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Uh, the garden was located within the region of Eden, and we actually know what end or side of the region the garden was located because Adam says eastward in Eden. We don't have any other point of reference, by the way, and you'll understand, um, you'll understand uh, that that's okay as, as we proceed. There, there's something else here. You may recall that we pose the question, why does God want us to know that the garden is eastward in Eden, even in spite of the fact that we have no other point of reference? And, of course, the one thing which we've already rehearsed and will continue to rehearse because God rehearses it over and over again, and that is that Eden was a real literal place. We don't know exactly where Eden was, but we know that it was real whenever God or anyone else, for that matter, uses any kind of direction, north, south, east, west. It testifies of the realness of the place. What we're about to see and appreciate is that God wants us in somewhat more detail to picture these things in our mind's eye. Again, it's that real. God anticipates that we're going to picture all of this. And here's the thing that I believe God is especially emphasizing with this direction reference. He wants us to keep in mind the east-west orientation of the garden. Part of the reason why I say that is because we have not only here an emphasis on the east, but we turn only a page or two to Genesis chapter 3, you're turning as I am, and verses 22 and, uh, through 24 where again there's an emphasis on this eastern direction, and it's in regard to the effects of the fall, which obviously we haven't gotten to, but each and every time that we've been together, I suppose we have referenced it because we know that it is coming. Take a look at uh, Genesis 3, verses 22 through 24. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. That is in his fallen state. We will obviously say much more about that when we get to it. Therefore, verse 23, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Again, I am restating by way of emphasis that God, for some reason, wants us to keep in mind this east-west orientation and to say it a little bit more specifically and practically, the Garden of Eden was positioned in an east-west line. And again, for some reason, God wants us to know that. And as you begin to think that through with me, you'll recognize that as Adam and Eve traveled eastward, it was out of the garden and away from the presence of God and were they to travel westward, it would be toward the garden and toward the special presence of God. By the way, as you continue to think this through with me, and I even made my own diorama. Wow, you guys could have to pay extra for that. <laughs> as you continue to think this through with me, please understand that God has always had a special place for his special presence. And what's interesting about that is that we know 
and worship and serve the omnipresent God who is everywhere present and the transcendent God who the universe, whom the universe cannot contain. So listen, we know these perfect character traits of God that he's both omnipresent, everywhere present and transcendent. Nothing can contain him. In a non-theological and Tommy Teal language thing, God is that big. By the way, just in case you're going through a difficult trial or trouble or tribulation and you think that your trial, your trouble, your tribulation is so big, listen, it can't hold a candle to the great big God. And that's why we're here to worship him. That, by the way, is why you came to worship God even in the midst of your trial and trouble. Even in the midst of your tribulation because God is that big. And I'm telling you, for me, it's worth the trip if that's all that we identified together. If that's the only way in which we worshiped our God, it would have been worth the trip. So here's this omnipresent, transcendent God, and yet he has, in regard to human affairs, he has always had a special place where he graced that place with his special presence. And the Garden of Eden was one of those places. That's why Adam and Eve were able to walk with God there. And of course, you know later down the annals of time that God would grace the nation of Israel with his special presence in the first tabernacle and then subsequently the temple. Gracing the temple with his Shekinah, what an awesome scene. And then there's a future place. Because God always has and always will, and God always has, God does, and God always will have a special place. And so there's a future place where God will grace men with his special presence. But God here, in regard to Adam's narrative as he walks us through the Garden of Eden, is prompting us to think of the east-west orientation and thus my diorama. It's primarily for you, for me, because it's too small for you to see. Uh, John and Julia are about the only ones that will be able to appreciate it. And I'm not sure that there's a whole lot to appreciate it as far as the artwork is concerned. And, and in fact, if you knew all the places where I borrowed this stuff, you would get a kick out of that as well. But listen, even though this looks a little bit strange, I want to emphasize again just how real. I want you to note the directions with me. This is south. This is north. This is west. And down here is east. Now remember what we've learned about the Garden of Eden. We said, again from Adam's narrative, that the Garden of Eden was elevated. One of the reasons why we know that the Garden of Eden was elevated is because there is a river that runs out from the garden. The chair represents God's special presence. You wouldn't be wrong if you think of this being even the throne of God. But the chair, which is a doll chair that was hanging up on Mrs. Ann's uh, bedroom wall, and now she's missing one. So you be very, very careful with this. And uh, these I borrowed from the two- and three-year-old room, because all I have is G.I. Joe's. And I, I didn't want to lose you with that. And I got to thinking about these little figures, and I thought, this actually works. Because here's Adam, again, real. He certainly didn't look like this, but here's Adam. He's that real, and in fact, he's even got a hard hat on, which means, reminds us of the fact that when God created Adam, he did so with a work ethic. And, and this I like even more. Here's Eve, and of course she is 
sharing in the workload, so she too has a hard hat on. But what I really like, and I, I, I wish that God would have emphasized this a little bit more in the narrative, is that she's got a, a pad of paper and she's taking notes, <laughs> which means that she's not a Neanderthal. She isn't a cave woman who's walking around and making grunts and all kinds of other noises. They knew how to write. They knew how to record. And uh, because of them and many other of the human writers, obviously all the human writers in the scripture, you and I have the inscripturated word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, because it was written down. Thank you, God. Eden is Israel. It's graced by the very special presence of God, Adam and Eve were placed in the garden to till it. A wonderful, beautiful river that watered the garden flew, uh, flowed down from the special presence of God and not only watered the garden, but then as we've read time and time again, it, 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 it extends into four different river heads. That real. But Adam and Eve sinned. And as we read, and again, we're jumping the gun. I hesitate to do that, but I don't know how else to do it. And we'll have plenty to talk about and say and do and see when we get to the actual narrative. But I don't know how to consider the first couple chapters, chapters of Genesis apart from understanding that Adam more than likely is actually the one who is narrating our tour. And, and we know that he and, he and Eve are about to fall. And so we read from the following chapter, then Genesis 3, that as Adam and Eve sinned and fell, they were driven, and God wants us to know the direction. Again, it's interesting, and I probably will not do a good job in helping you to appreciate this, but this east-west directional thing is important to God, and it actually gives us the floor plan for the Garden of Eden. The special presence of God elevated on a mount, a river running down. And as Adam and Eve sin, the text tells us, Adam reporting himself, that they were driven eastward. Here, the presence of God enjoying the fellowship and communion with God in a most perfect way, they sin and they're driven eastward out of the garden. So they're here, and they walk in an easterly direction, easterly direction out of the Garden of Eden. Now one other tidbit that again is jumping the gun, but we've already read and you already know, that after Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden, God puts two cherubim, at least two cherubim, to guard them from going back in the other direction. Now listen, man eventually is going to be able to get back to having fellowship and communion with God. But as our text stated, the last thing that God and man wanted to have happen as, as Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden because of their sin, for them to turn around apart from any covering from the gracious, merciful, and loving God the last thing that Adam and Eve ought to have done is to turn around and take of the tree of life and live then forever in their fallen state. It is, and there's some questions here inherent in that, and we will address them when we get to it, but it is a picture, again, of what it's like for man to be separated from God for all of eternity. And so cherubim were placed at the east, eastern end of the Garden of Eden to prevent man from going back, taking of the tree of life, and forever being separated from God. But there's another place. There's another place that has the east-west orientation. And it is the tabernacle slash temple of Israel. Where the 
high priest will focus on him. We will envision that it's the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, where he would enter from the east, heading in a westerly direction. He would come into the court of the priests, and then subsequently enter through the first veil into the holy place of the temple proper, and after going through the holy place, where on the left side, the south side, was the, um, was the candlestick, and on the right side was the table of showbread, and right in the middle was the altar of incense, having come through one veil into the holy place, and then entering only one day on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, into the Holy of Holies, which actually housed the presence of God, his Shekinah glory. He moved from the east to the west. He moved up, if you will, from the court to the holy place, and finally into the Holy of Holies, which housed the very presence of God. For the priest to move from the east to west was to come into the presence of God, and when he completed his duties and moved from the west to the east, it was as if he was going away from the presence of God exactly the same way, not the same thing, but the same way in which Adam and Eve, when they were expelled from the garden, moved from the west to the east, away from the presence of God. You say, past Tom, why the silly diorama? Why the strong emphasis? And I hate to disappoint you, but God is taking great pain in communicating to us the realness of these places. This is real. By the way, you students, you know something that is also very interesting in regard to the similarity between the floor plan. In fact, the similarity runs beyond the floor plan. If I didn't say it well to you, the floor plan for the Garden of Eden and the floor plan for the tabernacle slash temple of Israel are exactly the same. Moving to into the presence of God and away from the presence of God. But the similarity runs deeper than just the floor plan because you know something, you students of the word, and I've already told you about it. You know that when Adam and this part, you know that when Adam and Eve left that placed at the entrance of the garden were cherubim. Do you remember what was embroidered on the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies? Do you remember what the high priest on the day of, uh, of, of atonement would, would see just before he pulls the veil aside a little bit to slip into the holy of holies? Cherubim embroidered on the veil. It's that real. And what I can't believe is that God actually cares about the floor plan of these things, and he takes the time and, again, the pain to communicate that floor plan to us. Why? Well, I think we'll probably for all of eternity be exploring the answer to that, but I know part of the answer, and we've already gone there in our mind's eye because not only was the Garden of Eden real, oh, so real, a real, literal place, with an actual floor plan. And not only was the tabernacle and temple of Israel real, a real literal place with an actual floor plan, but there's another real literal place. It too graced by the special presence of God. And it is the eternal home of each and every one of you who have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven. That real. God, through John the Revelator, actually gives us the floor plan. Guess what? It runs east, west. 
I'm going to say this now before I forget to say it, and then we're going to talk a little bit about heaven. Glory, hallelujah. You are already reminded of the fact Lord Jesus Christ is poisoned and ready to return, and we may be entering this real literal place before the day is done. By the way, I absolutely forgot what I was going to say to you. That was <laughs> over the top for me. I, I, I have left you. God wants us to recognize this east-west orientation and be impressed with the fact that there are three literal physical places where God has, is, and will grace such place with his special presence. The Garden of Eden, that real. We even have the floor plan. The tabernacle and temple of Israel, we even have the floor plan. In heaven, our eternal home, we even have the floor plan. But but listen, I'm... I, I'm going to come back to this, but, but listen, not everybody, I should be pointing up, not, not everybody goes there, but it's that real. God takes great pain in expressing to us the realness of both heaven, the eternal home of those who have put their faith and trust in Christ, and hell, the eternal home of those who have rejected his one and only solution for their sin. Remember, there has got to be a covering for man's sin. And it was temporarily cared for in the Garden of Eden and in the tabernacle and temple of, of, of Israel and then permanently cared for by the Lord Jesus Christ as he hung on Calvary's cross and shed his blood, bearing the penalty of every man, woman, and child so that they could be forgiven and given the gift of eternal life. that real. John the Revelator in Revelation 22 he talks about a place the eternal home of God's people and as you would expect the focal point is the throne of God and of the Lamb he says and then he says something amazing that flowing out of the throne is a river. It's called the river of life. And it waters the garden so much so that John impresses us with a tree that we have seen and heard of before initially in the Garden of Eden. John the Revelator in regard to your eternal home says that that the tree of life is on both banks of the river. And you say, well, I don't know about that. Maybe this is figurative language. And you come back, I'm going to get um, uh, uh, in trouble for this. But uh, dad and mom, when you were living at uh, Grandma Grove's, um, or, or, or Grandma Carey's in Bay City, on the side of the house was a tree. Was that a silver maple where all the sprouts kept coming up? Do I have the tree right? Just in case you're wondering if a tree can be on both sides of the bank of a river, the answer is yes. And we have examples of that. I'll never forget this. It's part of the reason why I engaged uh, Mom and Dad Grove. They had to cut the sprouts from the roots of this mother tree, just like grass, because they grew that quickly. On both sides of the sidewalk one mother tree, but there are certain trees like the silver maple, some of our aspens, and the willow tree, where when from the mother tree the roots grow out like this, guess what? Little trees start popping up from the actual root of the mother tree. So I want you to know that we actually have a horticultural explanation for the tree of life being on both sides of the bank of the river.
I wanted to say something to you about the millennium, but I know I would lose you with that, apologize, and so I shouldn't have even brought it up to you, but alas, I did, and I, now I retract every single word that I've said from about a minute and a half <laughs> forward. Here's the thing. We've hinted at this, you know it. I mean, it's really part of our testimony. This is primarily for those who are here today who have not yet put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Revelator, we've referenced him, Revelation 22, says something. It's, I, I think it's devastating news. He, he gives us a floor plan for this place. It's that real heaven. He gives us the floor plan. He tells us that the tree of life is there, a river flows out of the throne of God, talks about the building that you are very much aware of, that real. But he says, not one unclean person or thing can enter this place. And you say, well, Pastor Tom, why would you be so sad about that? Because we're all unclean. We've all sinned. Yea, we are sinners, Romans 3.23. God, guess what? He knew what he was talking about. All have sinned and fall way short of the glory of God. To picture this real literal place, all have sinned and can't go to this real literal place. Why? Because of their sin. But remember that the holy God who is offended by your and my sin is also the God of love and mercy and grace. And so he said, I will send the one and only divine solution to them to care for the penalty and even power of their sin. God, at that point in time, would be done with the temporary coverings. We will, when we get to uh, Adam and Eve in that part of the narrative, we'll watch and listen and look as God, uh, God uh, um, kills an animal and takes the skin and temporarily clothes Adam and Eve. And God will be done with all of the temporary covering of the thousands upon thousands, yea, millions upon millions of sacrificial animals which is a measure of the gravity of our sin. And now here with Christ, he'll provide a once-for-all sacrifice for sin for every man, woman, and young person. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, he and only he, offering to you and me the gift of eternal life, forgiveness of our sin, and heaven, as our eternal home. You can't approach the presence of God apart from a covering. And the Lord Jesus Christ provides his shed blood for an eternal covering for our sin. Why would you say no to that? Listen, it's time to say yes to Jesus. You say, well, Pastor Tom, I, I'm hearing that. I understand that. I even sense that someone, it's the Spirit of God, is tugging on my heart. What must I do? Don't you love the simplicity of the gospel? I mean, with understanding, if you recognize that you're a sinner and you realize that the Lord Jesus Christ is death, burial, and resurrection is God's one and only solution for your sin... Don't you love the simplicity when God says, so whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. God, be merciful to me, a sinner, Lord Jesus Christ. I am today claiming you as my own personal Savior from sin. And you don't even have to say it that dra dramatically. little heartfelt prayer from a six-year-old boy, G Jesus Come into my heart and be my, my personal Savior. That'll do it. Listen, be saved because God has always graced certain places with his special presence. 
and the best is yet to come. Don't miss heaven. Because if you do, what it's called is hell. And the last thing you want is to be separated from God for all of eternity. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? I'm talking, child of God, you, you can be praying, although, boy, you know, even what we've done today, it ought to bring revival <laughs> to the hearts and lives of God's people. But, but you can be praying, especially for those who are here within the sound of our voice. We love and appreciate our extended ministry through CD, DVD, and all that. You're going to be praying for those who have not yet put their faith and trust in Christ. And, and I want to give you a quiet moment. We have just a moment. I want to give you a quiet moment to do that very thing. I, I think that we've expressed the gospel in its simplicity. And I trust that you know that it boils down to then, once you have come to grips with the gravity of your sin and have realized that there's nothing you can do in order to save yourself, once you have arrived at the place where you're willing to look outside of yourself to one, the only one, who can save, deliver, rescue, forgive, then all you need to do is call on his name. And I'm giving you a quiet moment this morning to do that very thing. Listen, you pray your own prayer, pray it from the heart, that's all that God cares about. But this is the bottom line. Lord Jesus, I know that you died for me, took my place on Calvary's cross, and I know that you and only you, through your death, burial, and resurrection, offers to me the forgiveness of sin, the gift of eternal life, heaven as my eternal home. And this morning, I'm calling on your name. I'm inviting you into my heart and life as my own personal Savior. Now listen, heads are bowed, eyes closed. We'll do nothing to embarrass you. But man, I'd love to know that you prayed that prayer. And man, I'd love to be able to pray for you further as you begin what is a great adventure in knowing first and then walking with and loving and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You prayed that prayer, you want me to know. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you simply raise your hand? I'll identify that a hand's been raised. Once I do that, you can place it back down. You prayed that prayer this morning. You want me to know. Thank you. I see that hand. Anyone else? And child of God, how then should we live? We've really seen it again this morning, haven't we? We've seen the gravity of our sin. And we've seen the uniqueness of the one and only Savior. And we've been reminded of the way in which he has transformed our lives. We are forgiven. We have the gift of eternal life. Heaven is our eternal home. We have the Holy Spirit of God who strengthens and empowers us. How should we then live? Again, it's the workings of revival. I mean it. We ought to leave here this morning a revived people. Heavenly Father, I pray that you continue to impress these things upon our hearts, certainly and especially the gospel. And oh God, I thank you for the way that you've worked in many hearts this morning. And I pray that you would drive these things deep into every heart. Thank you for our salvation, so rich and free in Christ and Christ alone. And Lord, stir us beyond salvation to live out our lives for this one who loved us and gave himself for us. Bless your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll all stand before God, either, either in praising him at the rapture for our redemption or standing before him as he being our judge. But we'll all stand before him face to face. Let's stand and sing 128. I pray that your face to face encounter will be with him as your redeemer. Verse 1 of 128. Face to face with Christ my Savior Face to face what will it be
I've asked Brother Corey Sisko to please close us in, a pr in prayer. Dear Lord, just thank you for this time you've allowed us to study your word and to worship you, Lord. Just thank you for your, for your Bible and the truth and all your words that you share with us and the symbolism and the ways you link things together. Thank you for being our own personal sin offering, Lord. Uh, destroy the veil and to allow us to have fellowship with you. Just thank you for it. Um, thank you for loving us more than we can comprehend, Lord. Your mercy and grace goes beyond anything we know. And a good question is, you love us so much beyond comprehension, Lord. How much do I love you? How much do we love you as a church, as a people, as a body in Christ, Lord? You told us that we need to not only know your word, but to do it, Lord. That's, that's how we love you in return, Lord. Please help us to take that up and to be living for you and loving you in a practical and a real way, Lord. Amen.